All right. We have a pretty tight schedule, so um, I think people will join, but I think we could maybe already start. Um, Vitor, could you uh, could you give a quick introduction or opening note? Sure. So, um, can are you listening to me? Yeah. Um, okay. So, welcome everyone to the second XR Effect Symposium. For those who, of you who are just now getting in touch with uh, this foundation, uh, we are committed to connect uh, end user training organizations, academia, and uh, industry partners um, who can collaborate in uh, researching the effectiveness of uh, using technology for education and training purposes um, in different professional contexts, from firefighting to medical emergency, fire investigation, or driving to emergency responders, just to mention a few. All the, the three different partners uh, play a critical role and being involved in this partnership brings benefits to all. The industry partners have the, opportun the opportunity to improve their products, certify the effectiveness of their equipment, and show their research support. The feedback of the end user training organizations will be gathered during the research and will be passed on to the industry partner on that on what they they think they could be improved on the other end research organizations benefit from the collaboration by getting access to a large amount of data gathered by end users and by contributing to the research that is done on this subject they also benefit from collaboration by sharing their knowledge and experience with other research organizations the end user train, training organizations get an opportunity to try out the newest training equipment before purchasing it. It allows them to test out the, the state of art equipment in their training environment and become aware of its possibilities. My name is Vitor Reis and I'm a member of the board of XR Foundation representing the end user training organizations. We will attend excellent presentations during the next two hours, giving notice of results around projects and activities that are taking place in different countries and organizations. 2022 was a very busy year for us and our partners, and we are convinced that 2023 will bring even more projects and activities for everyone. We invite you all to participate in the discussions through questions and sharing your experiences. We will, we will also have a, a space for dialogue between partners to discuss possible collaborations. Thank you for your participation and we hope that this symposium will meet your expectations. I pass the floor to my colleague, Roy. Yes, I'll quickly share my screen, let's see. All right, can you guys see it? Good. Um, so yeah, the second uh, symposium of XR Effects. So good to uh, to see uh, all of you uh, here. Um, yeah, so the planning for today, we've got four uh, presentations as Peter also, also said. Um, we've got the first two presentations from Julia and Catherine, then we'll have a short break. Uh, then we have two more presentations uh, from Omar Augustusson, who will all, uh, of course, uh, introduce themselves, and uh, Cecilia Weigmark, um, who will um, tell you a little bit more about the ongoing research uh, right now and what we're working on, what our goal is. Um, then we have a, a possibility for people to meet with each other. So if you think that some research was very interesting, you want to learn more about or you want to um, get in touch with someone, then that's the opportunity to talk to each other. Um, we'll look at how many people we are. Um, if, if there are some more people joining, we'll probably go into breakout rooms, else we'll just do it in the general chat. And then we have a closing note by uh, Martijn, our um, industry representative board member. 
So just some accomplishments of us this year. Uh, we've got new partners. We're uh, contacting a lot of uh, different organizations, trying to get them on board. Also, uh, what's good to see is that organizations are contacting us to become members. So that's, that's very nice. Um, we helped our partners flame uh, uh, during the Hanover exhibition, where we had the opportunity for people to also talk to us as XR Effect. Um, we spoke to a lot of interested people, uh, which was also a very nice addition. Um, of course, the Brazilian Sweden collaboration that has just uh, uh, published uh, its paper, which can also be found on our website, and uh, which will, uh, Cecilia will talk more about. Um, and uh, another research that we uh, um, supported this year was a medical skill simulation. Um, so yeah, um, so for future symposia, um, we want to do one more symposium at the beginning of June or around that time. Uh, we'll update you uh, on the latest projects and latest uh, um, yeah, progress that we, uh, we've accomplished. Um, so you will all be informed uh, later on, we'll send the exact date to you um, or through our social media. Um, then, oh, no, that was it for me for now. Um, so let's start with the first presentation. I know I'm a little bit early, but then we'll have some, some space uh, for people to ask some more questions or etc. So for our first presentation, I will give the floor to, uh, to Julia. Thank you very much. Just a question to share my screen. Yes. Uh, please let me know if you can see anything. Yeah, we can see it. All right. So, uh, as Roy said, um, my project uh, that I want to present for today is uh, entitled Investigating the Sense of Presence and its Effects on Learning uh, with CIMEX Technology. This project was made uh, along with the collaboration uh, of uh, XR Effect and uh, Utrecht University. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to present myself. My name is Julia Zaha. Um, I'm a master's student in my second year at Utrecht University studying game and media technology, and my focus is uh, mainly on uh, immersive technology and healthcare. So the context that um, gave the start of this small project um, was that medical staff teachers um, generally are not uh, fully convinced about VR benefits, um, which is an unfortunate thing because VR has uh, developed in the past years um, considerably and is becoming more and more reliable. And uh, it's used in many other domains. Um, and another aspect would be uh, medical emergency equipment that can be very expensive, especially for university institutions uh, that have to uh, pay for more equipment for their students. And uh, if you take a bit of time to think about uh, setting the equipment up, setting it down, it's time consuming. Um, and if students have to do it and they're not properly trained, uh, they might damage it or uh, break it. And that's again, very expensive. So uh, this small project come as a, comes as a solution in order to investigate the VR's benefits um, with uh, CIMEX um, medical scenarios uh, in order to prove that uh, yeah, it can be used uh, also by medical, medical staff teachers. So the research questions that I was, um, that, uh, I was uh, investigating was the fact of uh, the self-presence, the, the, the feel of presence, uh, that um, can be felt in uh, the CIMEX environment in relation to traditional skill training. And if this presence has a specific effect on participants' uh, learning. And of course, uh, I thought that uh, participants' opinions is very valuable. Um, so I also asked for their opinion towards the CIMEX uh, immersive uh, virtual reality technology. Um, about the approach that I've um, that I've uh, done, I applied a theoretical framework called CAMILLE, which stands for the Cognitive Affective Model of Immersive Learning. Um, and 
which um, basically describes how uh, presence and agency can lead to learning outcomes. Um, and uh, because of the time constraints, I won't, uh, I won't uh, go too uh, much into details. Um, however, you can see that there are some factors that can trigger presence and then uh, presence can also, of course, uh, trigger effective and cognitive factors that would lead to uh, learning outcomes. So this experiment took place at Radboud University in Nijmegen uh, with eight students in their second year and their teacher, which makes this project a pilot study. Um, how, and I'm going to talk a bit about experiment design. Um, it was um, divided in three sections. So first, uh, it was the background questions with the GDPR forms um, compl completion. And of course, because I was investigating also learning uh, curve, I uh, try to I try to measure the, the knowledge before and after. So they also had the pre-knowledge test and then a post-knowledge test. And then we are talking about the, um, the main uh, section of this experiment, which was uh, performing the scenarios, an easier scenario and the more difficult scenario for the students. Uh, these uh, scenarios were accordingly picked um, accordingly with uh, their syllabus. And after the after the uh, performing of these scenarios, they had to complete a survey, um, yeah, about their opinions and how they felt, and um, yeah. Uh, so this is a short uh, description of uh, how everything uh, worked. Uh, in the um, in the corner, we can see what uh, teachers or instructors can see, and they can control the environment. Um, this is uh, the. CIMEX anaphylaxis scenario, and uh, this student had to um, administer epinephrine. Well, I, would... <laughs> I don't care, I never could. I haven't had a reaction in decades. And so he also, he mentioned that he doesn't wear an epinephrine. Do you know, um, you have a, a medicine cabinet. Do you know what you get from it? Do you know what the, what the medicine is called? Uh, is it epinephrine? Yes, exactly. So go to the medicine cabinet, and grab some epinephrine. So on the second shelf, there are these pre-filled uh, syringes, the spider. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So grab their epinephrine. And you see those blue boxes. Do you know where to put the, uh, the needle in his uh, body? Uh, yeah, in the base. Yes, exactly. So put it in, and with the joystick, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, put the joystick forward. Yeah, so now you can see, okay, it's getting empty. Yeah, great. All right. Yeah, you can let go. Yeah, and then you can ask again, hey, sir, is it a little bit better, or? I think I'm feeling a little bit better. So we can see that, um... From, from the video that um, teachers have uh, full control over the over the uh, scenario they can um, take the uh, learning objectives as a student they can control the dialogue um, yeah and if the patient gets better or worse so it's uh, very useful for learning now, when it comes to results I um, I first want to talk about uh, the feeling of presence that was felt uh, by 88.9% of, uh, of the participants on the Likert scale. Uh, we had some questions uh, to, to measure the realism, uh, the uh, embodiment, um, how, how present they felt and how immersed. Um, on question five, we can see a bit of an odd uh, variable, but um, I want just to assure that uh, this was about the cognitive load, which has to be uh, smaller in order to have more information attainment. So, uh, meaning that uh, this uh, this variable looks looks fine in this context. Right, uh, and talking about the uh, uh, learning curve. Uh, in the picture, we can see uh, the differences of uh, the first knowledge test and the second knowledge test, with the uh, highest improvement reaching 33.3%. Um, now, um, this can be leveraged um, in case of uh, a regular use of CMEX scenarios. And uh, why is that? Because um, these students that perform the, the scenarios um, are medical students that 
uh, never used VR before, or maybe only once, uh, meaning that for them this was something new, so they were very excited to try it out more than uh, being focused on learning. Um, yeah, so then again, the simple solution would be uh, to use uh, regularly uh, the CMEX uh, immersive virtual reality scenarios uh, to increase the learning rate over time and slightly decrease the excitement in order to focus on uh, learning. Yeah. Um, I also asked for uh, the opinions of uh, the teacher and uh, the students. Um, they, uh, uh, the, all the participants felt uh, as they have to save a patient, and that they were they were fully immersed and pre uh, fully, fully uh, uh, felt a sense of presence. Um, However, when, when uh, I asked them if they would replace uh, the traditional um, uh, emergency tools, um, they suggested that uh, CMEX can be used as an additional learning tool, um, not fully replace it, because uh, in, in some specific training, uh, it's very important to train on people. And uh, But uh, the teacher also uh, added that um, she would recommend uh, the CMEX the scenario to also uh, to their students and uh, her colleagues. Um, yeah, because uh, she thinks that uh, students, uh, especially for specific medical protocols, would remember better if they do it in uh, VR. So wrapping up, um, my, my uh, small project um, aimed to to um, come come uh, with a bit of more research for for uh, the the effective te effectiveness of uh, CMEX uh, scenarios, and we could see that uh, participants felt a high sense of presence uh, in these scenarios, and uh, that uh, the uh, cognitive affective factors from uh, that uh, theoretical framework uh, that were triggered by the sense of presence did affect the learning rate, uh, reaching up to thirty three four point three percent. Of course, this can be improved by uh, own overtime practice. Uh, and uh, yeah, CMIX technology can also be used as an additional uh, learning tool in, in institutions like, um, like universities or, um, or yeah, medical, medical training uh, institutions. This was my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, uh, I would gladly um, yeah, respond to them. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Julia. Thank you so, for having the opportunity to do this project, uh, also with the EXR Foundation, but also with you, Roy. It was uh, really a uh, fun, and uh, I learned a lot in this, in this uh, yeah, small project. Great. All right, so we got uh, some questions. Uh, Justina, let's start with you. Oh, or is it a clap? <laughs> oh, okay, it's a clap. <laughs> so anyone has? Okay, yeah, Andreas. So, so I was just wondering. You were talking about the possibility if the learning curve would be better if they would be able to practice more in the VR environment. Before this study, was was there time to like? get uh, get to know the VR um, I mean how long time did they have like practicing VR before they did the, the actual learning yeah so uh right before the experiment they had uh we we gave them the the uh, HMD the headset uh, and the controls they had um, like five or ten minutes uh to just um, explore how controls work um how they can move around a bit to see uh okay how how does it look like they could um, they could move a bit around to see how, how is the 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 boundaries of uh, the VR world. So they had a bit of uh, yeah five or ten minutes, but still yeah um, because it was the first time they were show. Oh yeah, it's okay. Uh, so we have got a recording. Um, uh, if you want to get blurred, just mention it uh, now. Then we'll blur you. Else we'll um, uh, just for the people that couldn't make it, uh, they want to see it back. Uh, we get multiple requests of people uh, to record it. So. If you do not want to be in the recording, then I'll make sure to blur you out. No? Great. Okay, save me some time. <laughs>
Um, then let's uh, move on to the next uh, uh, presentation. We're nice on schedule <laughs> or before schedule, but then we'll have some more time for questions and stuff. Um, Catherine, then the next presentation is yours. So. Oh, yeah. Have I got um that must be awesome. Bear with if I just maximize this end. <gasps> yes, we can see. Thank you much, Bree. All good. Yeah. Okay, well, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to meet with you all. I'm very fortunate, and I know quite a lot of people in this meeting through having been involved in simulation and simulation-based training for, for a number of years. But um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all. So I'm going to talk to you about command training and command assessment um, as a whole. And my background is, is quite unusual in that um, I was very fortunate to be an academic um, with a PhD before I joined the fire service as a career firefighter, um, which gives me a real really good solid grounding in both the academia and the application of academic principles to, to the world within which I work. During my career as a firefighter, um, I ended up being the lead for command training for, for my organization. All of that was centered around command assessment. And we um, regularly utilized a, a, an array of simulation-based tools to provide the opportunity for candidates to be tested in their ability during um, those simulations. And then coupled with my academic experiences, I was able to substantiate the data that we were generating, publishing it in academic um, publications and sharing that widely. Uh, I left the fire service in 2015. Um, I now work as a consultant back into the fire services providing the same service. And the one thing that I am incredibly passionate about is data-led training. Um, the sector within it, which I work, has for a long time paid lip service to the collection of information. Um, and I am desperately trying to overhaul the quality of the data that's being collated and using it to better inform training going forward to support the, um, the users for better um, learning experience, but importantly, support the organizations with understanding the quality of the data they've generated and how they can use those trends to inform their, their understanding, their co competence of their organization, but also um, the, the quality of the policies around which these individuals work. So these are the questions that, that I always ask when I'm, when I'm doing a presentation. And these are the, the pivots really about everything that I do. What is it that you're looking to achieve? How does somebody become an effective instant commander? Um, and within the domain, um, we have both technical skills, technical competencies, which I need to demonstrate, as well as non-technical skills. So the, the softer, the how, the, the communication skills, that not just what they're communicating, but how they're communicating it, all are really important when you to develop a very well-rounded individual who can appropriately manage risk, understand the environment which they're working, and then implement a plan to resolve the situation. Um, the best way to practice and develop those skills um, ultimately would be out in the field, out at real incidents, getting real hands-on opportunities and experience. But with that comes risk. Um, so it's much better to, to practice that within a training environment and that training environment needs to most accurately reflect real life in order for those experiences to become most tangible and sit with that individual forever so they can apply those skills at a later date. When should that development start? Well, I'm a big advocate of the thinking firefighter, so you shouldn't start training officers when they become officers. It's all about the preparation phase, about equipping them to make sound, rationalised decisions as firefighters so they can apply those skills as they progress on their, um, their journey, their career through the fire service. And then importantly, right at the bottom there, how should competence be assessed or measured? Um, this is really pivotal to the quality of the data that you're collecting. Um, I, I, I have developed a behavioral marker called effective command, which I'll um, explain a bit further in a moment, but that enables real quality data around people's behaviors and how they um, assess risk and communicate that risk to others and set appropriate plans and objectives, enables it to be assessed in a really succinct 
meaningful fashion. Um, I'm, it's not tick box training. It's not they did or they didn't do it. It's how well they achieved those competencies that you're looking to assess. And when you ask better questions, you get better data out the other end, which then you can then use to inform training cycles going forward. Okay, so the effective command um, tool is a behavioral marking framework, um, and it's been accredited by the, the awarding body here in the UK um, at Skills for Justice, and it's also certified by Coventry University for um, developing and assessing the competencies you're looking for in a commander. We have frameworks that exist for each of the four um, tiers within the fire service, enabling data to be collated specific to that in individual group. And it focuses on the demonstrate competencies from the, the role maps that are linked to each of those roles. And also align with other practices we have in the UK fire service around so multi-agency working um, and the guidance that we get from the government about the way we should work. So the tool is um, widely used within the UK. Um, all the, the red counties at the moment are the ones that are actively using the tool to generate data. And the blue ones are all those that are coming on board within the next um, few months. Uh, the tool works and it generates really solid sound data. And as such, it's been picked up and picked up across the breadth of the UK. And the advantage of this is it gives me more data. We've got a really, really solid data pool um, within the system from both career, uh, whole time organisations and those that are part time, because the competencies that that we're seeing demonstrated are differing in those two subsets for obvious reasons. And the way that we need to train and support those individuals, again, differs because of, the, of their origin. So when we look to assess this competence, we um, look at the journey an individual goes on from point A to point B. We're not, there's not a correct answer. There's not one correct way to put a fire out. There's a whole, array of options that individuals can use and we as assessors and the tool in particular assesses the journey from point A to point B. It's about the rationalization of how you get from A to B, the understanding of the situation that you're facing, your um, determination of the level of risk and the, the plan that you want to implement on that journey from point A to point B. That is what gets assessed, not has the fire gone out. It's much bigger than that. The understanding from the complexity of the situation, um, minimizing risk to individuals, minimizing damage to the property, and the efficiency of the response. So point A to point B is what we assess. And it all revolves around Bloom's taxonomy, um, which is uh, um, determines the, the verbs or the questions we should ask depending on the outcome that we want to achieve. Uh, lots of the fire service traditionally focused on right at the bottom, the, the remember, only expecting people to be able to remember what they should do or remember what the policy said. My training focus is much higher at the top, so we want people to remember what they should be doing, but understanding it and being able to appropriately apply it to the situation, analyse whether the approach is working, evaluate a whole array of options, and if necessary, create a solution to solve the problem that is completely brand new. And those are the principles around which effective commanders should be working to maximize their efficiency. So how do you get there? You create thinking individuals, people who can solve problems without just following a process. Really, really highly skilled. Um, so you work on decision-making behavior rather than just the tick box competencies. We uh, work on applying that approach through the whole of the organization from the bottom all the way to the top, because that way you have a common thread of understanding, right from the, the grassroots right to the senior managers who are in charge of the budgets. And that kind of training will compensate for any skill fade um, and provide assurance to the organization that what they're doing is correct. Again, we use this um, cycle um, based on Kolb's learning cycle, train people first, monitor their performance, assess their competence, review the data, feed it into the training cycle. Um, this is it's a very simple, obvious approach to training within any domain, but typically um, I, the, the tire is generally flat on at least one side. Um, and any organization I go with, to work with acknowledges the fact that they have probably dropped one of those key segments 
on that learning journey. Um, in the UK, we have an awful lot of focus on assessment, not as much focus on training, and the review piece is generally very poor. Okay, so how can you use this? So in the UK, um, we use this, the tool for um, documenting training, documenting performance at real incidents. Individuals can use it to record their data. Um, training departments can use it to record um, formal training or formal assessment. And all the data goes across into one database. So you've got a whole array of data around exactly the same measures, but collected from multiple different streams. And that data can be downloaded and analyzed to, to inform future practices. Because of the array of data that we collect, we've got different reporting types because the credibility of the data differs depending on who's completing it. Okay, so formal assessment is completed by a dedicated assessment team that are generally in house, maybe using the simulation like Yulia demonstrated earlier uh, to, to assess those competencies. Training is much lower level, can be done by the individual. We also record information from real incidents, whether that is completed by the officer in charge themselves under incident attendance, or whether that's observed by a third party senior officer recording the performance of the individual. And we can also use it to record um, promotional assessments. So we've got lots of data in the system. It's all accessed by a website. Organizations that um, are using the system subscribe to, put, to access the tools. The data all goes across into the database um, and the data can be downloaded and analyzed by the end users. It's also supported by an array of training packages, um, publications, details of projects, that, all that kind of thing that, that generate um, credibility in the approach that we're taking. So I've got a whole bunch of data that I'm going to quickly share with you. Um, back in March, um, I downloaded the data from the system. And the tool in its um, current version has been in use for five years. So the data I've got represents the number of assessment reports that have been completed by the, um, the array of users. So as you can see here, the tool has been used increasingly over the last five years. We've almost got an exponential increase in the use of the tool. I've then analyzed the formal assessment data only to, to look at the trends that have been generated. So here we've got the four command levels, one, two, three, and four, the, the end number, the frequency of the tool of reports, we've got each of those four command levels and the average scores that have been achieved each of those command levels, and then plotted this data here onto this graph. What we can see there is we've got a, um, a reduction in competence between level one and level two officers. Now within the fire service, that's a really big step up Level one officers manage the scene um, on a fire truck as part of a large team, whereas level two officers come out as the supervisory officer in, um, in a car to assist with the management of the scene. And it's a very complex role um, and often individuals are not very well supported in their development. And um, I was not surprised in the slightest that we saw a reduction in competence and a statistically significant reduction in competence between level one to level two. We then extrapolated the data over the five years that it was collected over to see whether there was any particular trends um, over that five year time period. And, and overall, we're seeing a drop in competence between 2017 to 2021. It's important to remember that during this period of time here, we've had COVID. Um, training was um, very, very limited in the fire sector during that period of time. And um, it was generally delivered via Teams, Microsoft Teams, or some kind of online version. So the um, possibly the quality of the training that was delivered had diminished during that window of time. I then looked a bit further at the data. Now, within the Effective Command Assessment Tool, there are eight distinct pages of assessment. Okay, um, the first three are the phase of situational awareness, information gathering, understanding the information and anticipation. Then I have a whole page on decision making, one on planning, one on communication, one on command, and one on review. And this data presented on this slide here is um, 
further analysis of the actual scores achieved at each of the command levels on the pages of the assessment. So level one commanders, the lowest level of commander. Here we see the lowest score achieved was in anticipation. So the ability of inexperienced commanders to achieve the highest level of situational awareness, anticipation, being able to accurately see into the future and predict future events was the lowest score across the whole of that data set. Okay, um, and that data can be used to immediately fit fed into training cycles to change the way we're using the tool to better support those officers on their development journey. Level two officers, the, str the strongest area was in information gathering and the other areas were all lower, which suggests we need to develop them across the board with our instant management and support that decision making. Level three and level four officers are the most two most senior tiers in the organization the weakest areas were in communication okay um and anybody who's read any major incident reports will see that communication features heavily on any failures when things go wrong um so it was really interesting to see that this score also was replicated in simulation of what that what we're seeing in major incident reports um communication just needs to be practiced um it's supported by technology, supported by the tools we've got available, but high level communication at that top end of the organizational structure will have significant effects on the productivity and success of any instance. So the conclusions from this data um, were that we need to focus as much on development of officers as well as maintenance of those skills. Just training them at the beginning of their career is not sufficient. We need to maintain the quality and, and depth of that training throughout their career. This kind of evaluation of the data does provide an insight into a, an organization, enables them to determine where um, more work needs to be focused, where systems need to be improved, as well as identifying the strengths and weaknesses of officers, to enable those trainers to be fed directly back into the organizational training plan. And the granularity of this data is a really, really powerful tool because it enables individuals to highlight the specific areas they need to focus on and how to, in order to improve their productivity, their success and the, the service that have been provided to the, the end users, the community, within the, the productivity of the fire service. Um, and this kind of analysis should influence um, the, the resourcing of training departments, the the crewing levels on, on vehicles, the number of vehicles needed. There's a whole bunch of demographics that should be influenced by the quality of this type of data. And that as the tool is being picked up across the country, you know, we've got a number of projects now running internationally, the quality of that data and the, the capacity of it to influence the future is vast. Has anybody got any questions for me? Right, so thank you for your presentation, Catherine. <clears throat> thank you. I'm sure someone will have a question. No? Yes, I have oh, a question. No. I have a question to Good Catherine. Morning, Good morning. Uh, Catherine, can you please share how the process of implementing simulation and uh, especially computer based simulation has been in recent years in the UK? Um, as a method that is currently recognized uh, as valid for assessing the competences of incident commanders, whether for initial qualification or for revalidation of qualification. I guess it wasn't always like that. Um, how has uh, virtual reality technology gained uh, its place in training and assessment processes? That's a nice short question, Victor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so historically, training in the UK was uh, delivered using um, practical uh, props on the fire ground to develop those skills, um, but it's incredibly time consuming um, and needs a large, large team of um, facilitators, trainers in order to um, generate the outcome. Simulation provides opportunities for much quicker um, replication of, of those scenarios to get the ability to train more people in a more consistent 
and standardized way. Simulation has um, been quite embedded, very embedded in the UK for a long, long time. Um, I joined the, the train department probably 12 years ago in Oxford, and we had uh, simulation, we had vector initially, and then we went across to the XVR simulation package. Um, it's been used robustly and it is embedded throughout all training at all command levels. Um, predominantly um, for use for assessment, but we are seeing better um, abilities to use the software for training and maintenance of competence of those individuals. It, it gives opportunities for better quality and consistency of training, but that is definitely reliant on the, the skills and abilities of the trainers to deliver the training packages in a consistent fashion and um, the, the, the way that the, the efficiency of that training is analyzed is also very important. Does that answer your question? I've forgotten half of it, sorry. Yes, it does. It okay. does answer the question, thank you. Perfect, thank you. All right, then we also have got a question for more time, but he's unable to answer or to ask it right now. Um, there are multiple training methods for incident command training, including the use of virtual reality. Um, does your data allow currently or in the future, maybe for research uh, in the effectiveness of using VR as incident command training tool by comparing the outcomes of different fire services who use different training methods? Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Yes, because you're um, assessing somebody's ability to appropriately manage the scene, use the tools they've got available, the um, mechanism of the simulation doesn't matter. Um, whether it is out on the instant ground, whether that is on the drill ground, whether it's in simulation, whether it's using VR goggles, the mechanism with which the simulation or the simulated environment is provided does not matter. What we're measuring is the outcome of those actions, the decisions that people are making, the um, understanding of those decisions and how that uh, rationalized decision-making sits within the individual is what we're assessing, which gives us um, a huge opportunity to gather data from multiple different simulation platforms into the database. At the moment, we don't differentiate how that, what platform was used to generate the data. Mm -hmm. there, there could be huge scope for doing all of that. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, your, your research track. Excellent. Sorry, can't say more. Martin, yeah. I can't hear you. You're talking. Never mind. We'll talk later. Thank you, Kat. Okay, no problem. All right. Do we have any more questions for Catherine? No. Okay, so we are um, a little bit before schedule. Um, we, I think it will be good to have a short break of 10 minutes, um, maybe 15, um, and then we'll continue with uh, the other two presentations. Um, so yeah, grab coffee, grab some tea, uh, maybe a cookie, um, and then we'll meet each other at 10. Yes. You see it there? Yeah, we can see it. Great. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Omar uh, Okusun. I started at uh, this uh, Reykjavik Capital District Fire and Rescue in 2015. Uh, previously, I was an uh, electronic technician and a CrossFit coach. Um, we have um, the biggest area for uh, firefighting and ambulance service in Iceland. So we cover about 60% of the population, which is not big. Uh, I think we're 380,000 total or something. Um, right now we have uh, around 160 to 80 firefighters and we're hiring more because we started this uh, short, shorter work week thing. So we have, have, we're having some complications with uh, changing shifts and stuff like that. But um, uh, when we did the survey, uh, this uh, Cecilia contacted us for uh, this um, VR effect 
project uh, to explore uh, the usability and applications of VR technology for training firefighters. So that was uh, that project VR effect thing, with which Cecilia uh, probably has told you about. Um, originally, because um, I'm a tech geek a little bit, so I was exploring a lot of new stuff for uh, firefighting and, and ambulance, just uh, that's relevant for our job. So I, I spotted Flame Trainer a few years ago, when, it's, when it was fairly new, actually. So I, I sent them an email because we have this um, conference here every other year, uh, but they weren't able to attend that uh, in 2018 or 19. So we got uh, invited to take part in this research project, which was a great entry because uh, um, when you have something new that's unknown, it's hard for people to uh, uh, like small organizations like here, in Iceland to uh, invest uh, money to buy something that's totally new. So um, we decided to uh, uh, take part in the research, which was uh, cheap comparatively because we just rented the equipment and got these question questionnaires from, from the Norwegian uh, uh, like school there where they did the uh, research. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I thought she was gonna demonstrate the results from the um, from the research project, but I guess she'll do that later. So um, uh, it was built in the way that um, we got questionnaires for like uh, questions of what's your experience with computer games? Have you tried VR? Have you tried uh, what's your experience in firefighting, etc. So. Uh, everybody who participated had to uh, answer these questions before. So we know their experience and thoughts before they started uh, using the flame trainer. Um, uh, and you probably, you're probably familiar with flame trainer. It's, uh, prob it's the best VR simulator trainer for firefighters that, that's around and they've constantly updated it. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, 120 of our firefighters completed, which is a majority of our firefighters, uh, as well as we took it um, across the country and, and let other fire, fire fighting teams try it. And also the housing and construction agency, which has the education, we let them try it as well. So we, we went all in with this and everybody, uh, and we had uh, support from our chief and uh, like, um, like all our directors and tops, they were a part of this. So it went really well. Uh, and I had uh, another experienced firefighter with me called Runar because I just started in 2015 and and he's been way longer and he's just actually retired, retiring this year. So his, his credibility helped a lot with uh, getting our firefighters to uh, try it out because they're not not all of them are open-minded for new things like you've probably experienced somewhere uh so yeah we 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 um tried it all out before this we did like regular exercises with like cold smoke diving exercises with blinders and smoke machines and hot training in complex like con container complexes and now we just recently uh um started using a new training facility with with gas fires uh which is very cool it's from finland uh i don't know forgot the name of it but we have that as well so we have both flame which we use regularly now and then we have this gas fire training so we're very uh echo echo friendly and 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 modern in that way but we always want to uh we, we get buildings to try and as well and we, we try to have it as, as versatile as we can. So the research project was from Højskolen på Vestlandet, Vestlandet in Norway. And uh, it was well uh, supported by them. And I think we were uh, the one firefighting team that had the biggest uh, participation. And uh, we got a lot of uh, feedback from our firefighters who tried it and we sent it all back and, and that went to flame. So they they were they were uh, 
it got a lot of feedback from us. So we had some uh, moderate expectations for the, for the VR training. Uh, the technology looked uh, promising, but we went, went into the research project with an open mind, but still much enthusiasm. So if it had, hadn't been for the research project, we probably wouldn't have bought the equipment, uh, which we eventually did. Uh, and we got good support from Kaspas at VR Support System as well, and Martin Postman. Um, so um, all the tech support was very good. Uh, but you know, like it was, it's the it's the phrase you can't uh, put out fires with a computer. We heard a lot, uh, which is very common. But uh, those who were close-minded before they tried it, they always uh, liked it more after they experienced uh, the simulations. Um, so it's important to have uh, try to ease the access of new te technology by offering projects like this one because. Uh, you enter it with a different mindset than if you're investing in something new and trying it out without having references or experiences from other people. Um, so it took about three months, I think, to complete. And um, most of our firefighters uh, participate, participate, participated, as I said, and the um, project was uh, a good success here. Um, so it, it was fairly cheap to start that way because we just rented the equipment and uh, we got a lot of feedback and then uh, eventually we we decided to buy it after after it and the biggest advantage with flame is probably ease of access and uh, flexibility because it's easy, easy to set up and uh, the time efficiency for training versus real fire is is very different because you can just Take your headset off in the back and you're out on a call if it comes in um, and the cost of the equipment is pretty fair because if you if you use it and it's up to us to make it a good investment so it's mostly on my hands now to uh, keep it up so we have uh, trained a few of our, our firefighters to um, um, uh, oversee the training so it, it's very good and flame is also very good and uh, supporting so all the feedback they, that we gave them um, was uh, updated in the next releases so they always uh, make it better so it's a better investment by time um, we even took it some to some ex ex exhibitions and there's our president trying it it's probably the first president to try the flame system uh, and we had some media coverage as well and it's it's we can do a, more of that but We'll probably do that in the future, future and exhibi ex exhibit it more. And we also got the uh, flame extinguisher uh, like last year. So we'll use that more for training uh, for extinguishers and et cetera. Um, but yeah, so we went all over the country, really. We uh, went to four different departments and we had inv invited other uh, teams to come to us to try it. And one other team is going to buy it now, which is in Keplavik, where the airport is. So they will buy Flame as well because of uh, our our trial. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, after the pro. I, th I think it was crucial to get the project, uh, the, the the research project, to try it eventually. Um, it's a new training tool with totally different benefits than previous traditional training because we get different kinds of training that you can't do in real life. And it's a great way to train the nozzle, like different extinguishing techniques because you can try again and again and again. And for communication, especially because uh, uh, usually if you send a firefighter in a cold training or in a container, you can't really see what he's doing. And now you can see everything he's thinking and you can get reports right away. Plus, uh, uh, like assess the situational awareness, risk assessment, et cetera. And we also are going to use the, uh, our radios for the headset so they can totally immerse in the, in the VR setting with both headsets on. And you can even have like uh, heart rate monitors and breathing uh, apparatus to measure the ox uh, oxygen use. And that's everything that 
it's harder to train in real life. Uh, so so um, uh, the research project was a very good entry to, to try the equipment. Um, and we now use it in our basic uh, firefighter training and we're gonna use it in advanced training as well. And it's gonna be part of uh, like the regular training from now on. So we plan to take all our firefighters through the some scenarios like twice a year with all the other education we do. So it's a very good addition to our 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 training like we uh, uh, that we had before. So I, I think uh, for most uh, firefighters that that um, tried it, uh, they said it was fun. That's the first one afterwards uh and we're positive after trying it and uh what we can see especially with traveling around the country we see different uh tactics that fire like departments use and they have different cues and we have um usually the chief or the captain with the participant so he can see how it works and how he thinks to give uh real life feedback um so it was a positive uh, feedback we've gotten and people are excited to try it more and they always want to try more scenarios than we put them through which is very positive um, so um, the negative feedback has actually been very constructive because we've sent it to flame and and they've been very very helpful with uh, updating the scenario scenarios uh, according to the criticism and they've uh, we 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 had some technical problems as well, but but um, like the headset broke and we got a new one from them. And uh, then Kaspars came like recently and 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 overwent everything in the system, and so we're up to date with that. Uh, and the new additions, if you haven't checked it out, it's crazy. They're doing some really really cool scenarios right now, like landing on a, a like a uh french uh ship that's moving around and and a helicopter crashes on it or something it's crazy and 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 uh, airplane crash as well so um uh yeah the key to emphasize is that firefighters know that this is a supplemental exercise to other trainings and not to replace hot trainings when they're available and like i said to many of them who are critical is that no pilots are allowed to fly in this unless they complete some training in the simulator first. So this might be a just new way of thinking about how to train firefighters. Uh, and I think it's going to be more of this. And I think uh, what we definitely recommend that uh, you try to put more like research project or like some um, renting, renting for new technologies you have because it's um, especially like in Iceland because we're isolated. We we don't like we we don't send many people to uh, uh, well they they go to the like uh, big big showcases and all, all that. But it's you have to try it on your team um, to be able to see the use case of it. So it's better to ease the entry point by renting it or putting a research project. Research projects are even better because. Uh, then you get some data from it. It's not just hands-on trying, and, and that's more like a game. If you have a research project, it's uh, it's more you get you get more statistic from it, and it's easier to convince the tops to uh, invest in it because it it's uh, it's a new phase we're entering with with new training. And I think I think this and uh, Simmex and all the other techniques that are coming are going to be more used. It's just who's going to take the first step and how is the best way to implement it. So I think this was a very positive experience for us. And I'll definitely try to keep my eyes open for what you're all uh, talking about and, and see if some of that can be implemented here as well. So um, I, think, I think I've done my 10 minutes. So I would thank you for listening and please come with some questions if you have. Great. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. It was very nice to see that even the president um, tried the simulation. That's, yeah, it's probably uh, the first person, right? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> That's very nice. Um, does anyone have any questions for Omar? No. All right. Um, uh, you have my email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will also send uh, the email list around afterwards. So if you want to contact anyone here, then uh, uh, you can. Uh, maybe also uh, fun for you, uh, Omar, to uh, talk to Andreas from Skillster afterwards in the breakout uh, session. Um, mm -hmm. He might have something interesting for you as well. He will uh, uh, introduce him himself later. Um, right. Let's move on to the uh, next presentation, Cecilia. Yes, thank you. Really nice to hear your presentation, Omar. I'm looking forward to go to Norway and visit you. Um, no, to, to Iceland. To I, Iceland, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm in Sweden. Walking. I'm in Sweden. I go to I, <laughs> Norway all the time. And I, I actually lived in Iceland back in the days. So. Yeah. Yeah, so I look forward to going back. Yeah, you, okay. me too. Me too. Uh, I will talk about this a bit, uh, the overview of, of this. Um, I will talk about like uh, the, the finished and ongoing studies and some tips and tricks and uh, experience from implementing XR in organizations. XR, um, extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, all these ways of enhancing reality is providing really good possibilities for, uh, for skills training. I would like to take this opportunity to point out some of these tips and tricks for kickstarting the implementation in a user organization. And these are based on the experience from several studies. Uh, I will also show you some, some small uh, results from our current studies and uh, tell you about uh, some study, uh, starting studies that are starting right now. But overall, I would like to encourage you all to connect your studies and interest to XR Effect to share the experience and new ideas, um, for example, in a symposium like this. Um, in the research, there are several values of using XR uh, for skills training documented and recognized, as you also recognize. Many of these values are obvious and also recognized by user organizations. Yes, everybody agrees. Um, all or maybe one specific uh, may trigger the interest from an organization providing emergency professional skills training. But even though these are all nice and you can add, I'm sure you can add several points on this list. Um, even though all of these uh, values are nice, a list like this doesn't always con convince a user organization to invest in XR training. It often takes more. Emergency professionals organization often have a long tradition of live training and that is considered the most realistic kind of training, the real training. This is how it's done. Live training has been the only way of practice-based training for several decades. Since I work mostly in the firefighter community, my research is uh, very much in the fire service context. And in this context, uh, the tasks trained involve physical heavy work, heavy equipment, in smoke and in heat, of course, the training needs to include this to be considered realistic, but the question is uh, to what extent and what, what aspects are most important to involve. These training organizations often have their set uh, learning objectives that are fulfilled by the current training. The schedule is full and there's uh, not a big will to to replace any of the current training, uh, training methods. Uh, they are all necessary. Um, and we cannot just add two extra days of, X, of XR training. Um, and also, for example, in Sweden, the cost of live training is high, but it's accepted and it's seen as necessary. So it can be hard to find the need and the motivation to change these training formats. The organization, the managers, these instructors may be interested in what XR effect training can do, 
but with no previous experience, it's difficult to know where to start, uh, what requirements to set, what pro projects to, to choose, how to compare these. I mean, thinking in two, two years, five years from now, there will be lots of technology to choose from and how do we compare? And how do we uh, set the tenders and how do we plan for implementation? Uh, this is where a study can help. A study can help explore and learn about the technology, but also the training formats that are changing and see this in their or own organizational needs because we can dig further into the needs and the, our own learning objectives. An organization might ask for a cost benefit calculation to motivate the, the investment. Or there is a need to convince hesitative instructors in a pedagogical way. If there is no strategic goal to implement XR training yet, and there is no budget for it, and there is no clear decision, it's probably possible to at least plan for a small activity to explore and learn about XR training. This at least to avoid the potential risks of not knowing what's go going on in the XR training field. Uh, it's often also quicker, effective, quicker, easier, and much more fun to perform a study than to just read research from other countries and other training organizations that, that may not really feel relevant to your context. A study can help you identify the clear why the goal and the shining value that your organization wants to achieve by, by using XR training. It's often better with one big, necessary, high priority value than several nice values. Uh, in a study, you can also find the champions, the people that are really interested in this and that can really be the, the ones doing it. Um, and in a study, it's also really valuable to find the key managers who are really the ones who have the budget, who are the ones that can make these decisions for the short term and the longer term. And also to relate your study to research and international practices is valuable. This will support the quality of your work and it will support and enhance the interest and understanding that XR is here to stay and develop. Um, and by, by learning from other organizations and their exp experiences and collaborate in, in studies, you will, um, you will gain uh, exp uh, knowledge more easily. It's safe to plan a limited study with no further commitments, but you will increase the in-house competence that is really valuable when you go to a tender, to prepare the tender possibly, and how, and you learn how to, how you, what you need to think of for implementation. A master or a bachelor student project may be a suitable start for this. I'll show you some short, a short glimpse of the results from Finnish studies. But first I need to explain a bit about the aim of these studies and the, the focus. Uh, the whole point of training uh, people is to prepare the people to handle the real task in the real situation. The term train, training transfer is used to describe um, the process of which skills are acquired through training uh, and used in the real situation. So that is, if you are doing, if you that is, if you do you, if you do it in training, you'll do it the same thing in the real situation. So if you have an XR training situation that gives high training transfer, you know that your uh, trainees learn the right things in, for the real situation. So, um, but this training transfer has been uh, identified as uncertain for XR and for VR firefighter training. It's uncertain and it, it's, uh, it's a demand for more uh, research in this area. So training transfer in XR is affected by different things. 
especially the sense of presence that uh, Julia was talking about. The sense of presence, the feeling that the trainee is experiencing uh, this virtual situation as real and can act as it was a real situation. So it would have been easy to assess the training transfer of XR training if we would have been using VR for baking cakes, training how to bake cakes in virtual reality. Then we can assess if we are doing this, if we are baking the real cake really good or not. But for emergency professionals, for example, for firefighters, we cannot assess the training in real fires. It would be too, um, too much risk. And it's, it, sometimes it's not that often that it happens. So we have to find other ways to assess training transfer in extra training situations. And yes, uh, by assessing training transfer in the hot fire training at the practical training ground, um, it's also too limited and it's not the real situation. So we have to investigate aspects of um, aspects that are leading to training transfer, for example, the experience of presence. So the aim of these studies that I'm going to show you some, uh, some short results of, is to in, uh, the aim is to increase the understanding of how XR effect, XR firefighter training can supplement hot fire training in the participating organizations. This is done by comparing the user experience of presence in XR training with the current hot fire training and real uh, fire situations. There are examples from, from studies in Sweden, Latvia, Bahrain, Iceland, and Brazil. And I have summarized only two questions here. We have involved both uh, experienced firefighters and novice firefighters. And it's really interesting to see the differences in results. The studies have the same foundation, but different angles and different sub focuses. The first question regards the firefighters experience of presence in VR compared to previous previous experience of high presence in hot fire training, VR versus hot fire training. The results uh, are shown in percentage of participants who rate their presence as three or higher on a five graded Likert scale. Uh, the participants are grouped in um, by years of experience as a firefighter. You see from uh, zero to one years, two to nine, and 10 and above as the very experienced uh, firefighters. In total, there is 252 participants in these studies in different countries, as you see. The lowest results uh, in, were, uh, were shown in the groups of inexperienced Latvian firefighters and the medium experienced uh, Swedish firefighters. In all other groups, more than 75% of the uh, participants rate their experience in VR as similar, high or very high compared to the hot fire training. The next question regards the firefighters experience of presence in VR compared to previous experience of real fire situations. The same thing here, uh, the, the, the results are showing uh, three and above on the, on the leakage scale. Uh, the results show that the most experienced groups, uh, they rate 75% of the participants rate the presence in VR as similar high or very high compared to the real fire situation they have experienced. In this case, it's really necessary to dig further into to the experience and what that really means. Um, and this is done in, in the current articles published. Um, the ongoing study, uh, I'd like to finish to tell you about tell you about the study that's now starting in Norway. Um, the focus here is on the firefighters' attitudes to hot fire training and the risk of exposure of carcinogenic uh, particles in smoke and their thoughts on VR training to reduce this risk. Uh, also, we will interview the fire services about their attitudes, their plans, and the challenges uh, related to this issue. Uh, the interest for this study, the big why, the big priority value 
is based on the current cancer discussion in Norway. And this study is become, has become possible thanks to XR Effect Foundation and the two excellent bachelor students at the Western Norway University of Applied Science, uh, fire engineers, who will take on this study. Um, I will try to invite them to, uh, to present the results maybe at the next symposium. Uh, another ongoing study is a Swedish version of the effective command that Katrin was presenting. And we are now starting this study, looking into how to, how to use the system in Sweden. So I think my, my time is up. Um, and I thank you for it, your attention. And I look forward to the discussion in the breakout rooms. Any questions? I have a yes. question, Cecilia. Yep. <clears throat> Um, I think that um, at the research level, we are still very focused on proving that XR technology has at least the same value as real training. I would, I would even say that soon we will have more studies on the effectiveness of training and learning in virtual environments than in real environments. <laughs> This is because perhaps we assume that real training is always effective yeah. and that it's, it always translates into learning. Is it a, a stigma that we will overcome in the coming years? What do you think? Mm -hmm. In one of these studies um, related to, to the Icelandic data also, I'm looking further into where and why the, the motivation and if there are any validation of the traditional live training. It's just like, it's just becoming, this is how you train. So uh, I think we need to look further into the learning objectives and be make sure that we are really training what we think we are training and by looking at uh, closer at the learning objectives, we can also find out which, what training is doing, is going to be done best in VR and what is necessary in, uh, of some reason in the live training field. So we have to dig into both, to the whole, the whole training, <laughs> in the whole training context. And it's, it's, it's really exciting to, to dig into the history of, of training firefighters. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cecilia. All right, we've got another question from Simon. Uh, what would an ideal sample size uh, be to validate the value of XR? And how can we measure the cognitive retention of learning in XR simulation environment versus a live fire simulation? Uh, sample size. Ah, uh, it, 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 it's not really the size of uh, the, the group. It's um, more about the, what we are what we are researching, and to and you want to validate the value of XR and how we can measure the cognitive retention. Yeah, it's about the measuring. Uh, how how do we how do we how can we really say that this is the the right you're learning the right things. And because, as I said, you cannot really measure it if you cannot see the person in a real situation. And the problem of that, for example, in Sweden, it's like 67% of the firefighters are, are part-time firefighters. And if you, if you do a calculation, same thing we did in Brazil, uh, you can see that in, like in, for in Sweden, it's uh, on, on average 1.9 fires per firefighter per year. If you calculate on all the fires in buildings and the number of firefighters uh, grouped in teams. So, so we have to, that's why I'm, I'm looking into validating the, the aspects that are proven by research leading to learning, leading to training transfer, pinpointing what is necessary in, uh, in the fidelity and uh, present. Okay, 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, I will talk. <laughs> it's, it's just really, but I would say, like, I meet so many who, who like to have the proof of XR training value in some way. And I'm like, okay, where is the proof of uh, training value with the, with the traditional, tr traditional training? Uh, so we are now, it's, it seems like uh, with this new training possibilities, we are raising more demands on proof than we have ever done before. So this is really an interesting uh, discussion. <laughs> this is a question for Omar. Yeah, yes, so we can. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the CSIC thing, the only only time I, I saw someone get like nauseous with the VR headset is when I let my uh, five-year-old boy try the extinguisher in an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, uh, other than that, uh, people are, are very comfortable in the environment because we try it uh, in, in the flame. You start in the new updates, you start in a fire station where you do it like training step by step. And it's only when we make them go up like a gantry crane fire or something mm -hmm. where they feel like, like, dizzy or something but it, it's it's not lagging very much so they don't experience like nauseous or anything like that may i also uh, add something to that because i've seen so many people in in using using uh, flame uh, the only reaction we have had is the the tunnel uh, where there is a video riding up to the incident that has caused one or two people to take off the headset and feel sick but yeah, not and, the actual and, thing yeah, in the newest update uh, there's an airplane crash and then you're in the fire truck driving on the airway that's a bit weird because yeah. <laughs> you stand up and look around and it's like you're driving that mm -hmm. might make some people notice i don't know all right um so now the next is the breakout rooms, uh, but I'm doubting a bit if we should break the group into two groups or if we should leave it at one group because we're relatively small. Um, so do you guys think uh, two groups would be fine or one group? Maybe raise your hand uh, virtually if you want to uh, stay in one group. Or raise your hand in camera. That's also fine. Two. Yeah, well. Okay, we got already got multiple hands. Um, okay, we'll stay in one room then. Um, maybe a good uh, for the people that didn't present to uh, quickly uh, introduce themselves. Um, so let's start with uh, you, Suna. Okay, I remember to unmute. That's a good start. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, my name is Una, and I've been working with uh, training incident commander at uh, the North uh, School that MSP have in Sweden for a long time. I've also been an uh, incident commander myself for over 30 years and started to work with uh, Cecilia on the time we both worked at MSB uh, in 2015 we started in a small way and uh, I think around 2017 it it it, it raised a little and, and we got some uh, air under the wings and uh, still today we're working together in in some project and I think this is uh, a really good way to train and uh, I recognize uh, all uh, all things you talked about Omar in your presentation and I, I think I was uh, rather early by speaking honest as a firefighter that our live training ground it it doesn't feel like when you're on call and you've been in a real building. Uh, I 
always have been confused. Why are we sitting in a container filled of smoke and should in some way imagine that it's a good training through learning goals to be safe and, and make good reports out to our commanders and, and so on. Uh, I, I never felt uh, that I was uh, uh, inside the real building when sitting in a container. So I, I always had, had uh, some problem with that. And I think it's it's more and more people that get that insight today, and, and that's really good. And it's also uh, Catherine's uh, statistic show that we, we need to, to train the brain to, to make good decisions all the time. We can't just sit in a container and, and learn things. And also the result that Cecilia shown is uh, we, we can make learning goals that uh, really get us better and safer. I, I really like the flame system now when uh, I, I've been working with it a lot and we have tried different setups and uh, it's also much around how you do the, the practice. If they are alone or if you work uh, as a couple. I, I always was the second smoke diver going behind and you can add uh, some weird uh, message from the outside that uh, you probably have fire behind you and so on. And, and just, just to see how, how this uh, person you train reacts to different message coming in. So you have a good fantasy is also good to have when you put up the training, but always the learning goes in the bottom, I think. Today I work uh, just as a fire controller in uh, the region of uh, Jävleborg. So I'm not working with MSP, but I, I will uh, be a part of, of your composium and everything you do, because I think it's really interesting to see the, how all this will end up. Yes, yep, thanks. I hope you understand a little about everything. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, let's move on to you, Justina. Could you quickly introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting. Um, I, re I represent the um, uh, training school, a vocational school in Czech Republic. And one of the training courses that we do is firefighters. And uh, we joined the XR Effects Foundation recently, just uh, in this autumn. Um, we, as an organization, we also kind of um, joined the, the, the search or experimentation with XR um, relatively uh, not so long time ago. And we were actually testing the augmented reality with the HoloLens 2. Uh, for firefighters trainings. So we had the, our, um, which is like the educational project with Erasmus, where we had the testing the possibilities, what it is, in which areas we can focus to, to bring to the firefighters. So we were on a journey. And uh, as we are joining the, this foundation, we are very much looking forward to uh, learn different other technologies uh, that could improve the, the, the training uh, process. So we, uh, we see from the AR, the HoloLens as well, but quite potential. Uh, of course, we are seeing also the limitations of the, of the technologies. And we see from our practitioners and our professionals who also joined the experimentations that we are encountered this uh, <clears throat> uh, how to say uh, blockage of uh, that uh, the firefighters they most of the times they hands on and they have very skeptical uh, opinion about technology sometimes and if for example Holland has limitations and if we have challenges from technical point they start to become quite a bit disappointed <laughs> so yeah looking forward for uh, discussion and uh, cooperation with XR Effect Foundation. Thank you. 
Yes, great. Uh, we also got a question from uh, Omar. Uh, he is curious about what simulations you are running with the AR uh, HoloLens. Uh, we were trying to uh, see the potential. So we were trying out with the digital twins and we were focusing more on the um, visualize and train on the electrical cars, how to work with it, because usually it's expensive to for training centers to equip that. And also it's dangerous to, to, to train. So, but from technical point of view, focused on the digital twins, to, uh, to visualize it and also to assess the situation if there is accident. So to have a um, real size trucks in front of you and you can go around and uh, assess the situation. We have different um, scenarios, let's say. And in that case, it's also, uh, uh, we uh, assess the trainee uh, trainees way of thinking of further steps. Yeah, but where this project that we had, we have limitations in regarding to the development from technical point of view. So we had just elements we were testing. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, then uh, Andreas, could you present yourself? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. My name is Andreas and I live in northern part of Sweden. And I represent a company called Skillster. And we make vehicle simulators. Uh, so we started making simulators for trucks, uh, excavators, wheel loaders, and for vocational schools mostly. And uh, now, later, the latest year, we have um, developed uh, ambulance, fire trucks, uh, Bronto Skylift, for example, and police car. Uh, so um, we will link a study that the police. Uh, Academy here in Sweden did with our simulators. So they have seven simulators of our simulators and they made a, a study for the training transfer actually for, so they have like three groups, like one group did all, only training in the real vehicle. One group did 50-50 simulator and real vehicle. And one group did all the training in the simulator. And then the test was made in the real world. So this was a maneuvering test. Uh, with a police car, for example. And we're going to link that, I think, Roy. Yeah. <laughs> so you can have a look at that study as well. Yeah, I will um, send it in the email afterwards, and you can also find it uh, on our website. Yeah. So, so I'm really and interested. Andreas is going to be the first speaker, correct? Uh, at the next, the next one. symposium. Yeah, sure, I can, of course. And, and we actually are going to have a, a new study this uh, spring with the uh, ambulance and fire truck uh, uh, drivers who will they will practice like certain situations in uh, um, blue light driving so they will experience stuff in the simulators and then they will be tested and there will be two groups one that has not have been tested in the simulator and one who has been tested in the simulator uh, trained and then the test will be in the simulator also so yeah so if you have any uh, thoughts about vehicle simulations, uh, then come to me. Yes. Um, let's see who have we then. So Simon is unable to talk because it's a bit noisy. Um, um, so, but... Sorry, just, just can I say one more thing? Sure. Yeah, go <laughs> yeah, ahead. Just the result of the study is really important to tell. Like it was no significant difference between the different groups. So like the group that has been training in the simulators was actually a little bit better in the test. Uh, so that was nice to see. So from they were really skeptical, like the police about training with simulators. But after the study was done, then there was no question about it. So, so right now they're just using simulators. Yeah, so, great, great. Yeah, good, uh, a good addition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but also, Roy, allow me. Can you, you hear me like this? Yeah, a little bit robotic, but okay. Hold on. Can you hear me better like this? 
Yeah, yeah, way better. <laughs> Allow me to give a quick introduction about Simon. Simon Miller is the CEO of Flame Systems, who is one of our key uh, industry partners and has been one of the first uh, sponsors also of the XR Effect Foundation. So I'll I'll take his uh, introduction on my uh, shoulders. Yeah, I also wanted to introduce Simon, but it's good that you uh, okay. you did it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. no problem. No, no problem. No problem. Um, Pericles, I don't know if you could introduce yourself, or I don't know if he's enabled to speak. I I, do, I think he's enabled to speak. Um, well, Pericles just told me that he was addressing because he is from Brazil. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And Brazil course. is from. Uh, our industry partner in Brazil, also working very closely together with the University of Paraná and the Paraná Fire uh, Department, who is uh, doing research together with the University of Western Norway. Cecilia, am I correct to phrase it that way? Good. Um, all right. Yeah, so... Um then let's get the the discussion going um so what i thought was quite interesting uh maybe for omar and justina it would if we could set up a, a research of course um therefore we also need researchers which is a little bit problematic at this moment we're still looking for a lot of researchers also if you have the contacts of someone please uh, give them to us uh, we will try to contact um uh, contact as much research as possible um and then try to set something up um but yeah for for you guys would would it also be interesting maybe for you to to uh try out the skills uh, uh driving simulation what are your perspectives on that um uh, if uh if i can may start uh sure. I think what we see from uh, our experience that we started uh, not so long time ago with uh, XR in general from the technologies point of view in firefighting, we see that there is interest to try out. And also just to mention that as we are collaborating closely with professionals, uh, firefighters in Pardubice region where we are in Czech Republic, and uh, our the head of the uh, fire brigade, he has the background of the IT, so he has a little bit of more, you know, the 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 drive to 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 bring in for testing. So we have a very good attitude towards the technology. So we are very much interested to to test different technologies that, and especially if they are proved, you know, uh, we see the benefits of it. And what was the mentioned before by all the speakers? Uh, so we're definitely interested. So uh, and it's much nicer to have uh, already developed things, material, because with the uh, AR, what we experienced that uh, we have a technology, but we don't have a content that is developed specifically for the firefighters, for example. So we would be looking forward that is specialized for that. So yes. If, especially if it is really relatable or related, definitely yes. Good, nice to see. Omar, what are your perspectives on it? Yeah, I think uh, it sounds very interesting because we uh, do the traditional uh, practice with driving on with blue lights, just in an ambulance on a low traffic time, and police do it as well. So there's. Uh, there's uh, been a lot of uh, extra added focus on training, driving with uh, priority. So I think if if it would be possible to uh, try something like this without purchasing it right away, like for example, as a research project, it would be helpful mm -hmm. for all, all uh, first responders here. And we also, since they have the Pronto Skylift, we're buying a new, Pronto Skylift in our department that's arriving probably next year. So uh, simulation is is a is a, is a huge benefit because it takes so much time to uh, run through like drive it all over and find places to try. So if if uh, if what research uh, uh, they've done in in Sweden is um, if they can, if I can demonstrate that it's it's practical and useful and and 
and uh, actually better to try it in a simulation first, it would be a very good selling point to uh, push here. I think it's very interesting. And it could be a combined venture between uh, fire departments and the police if it's, if it's uh, located in one place. It would be very interesting to see it and try it. And there's actually, when I first contacted Flame, it's because we have every other year, we have this uh, educational conference called On Duty for Iceland for first responders. And there's another one due in, in October this year. And I'm part of uh, like organizing it. So any in input from, from this symposium would be great, either, either from Cecilia to demonstrate uh, the results of the research, because I'm going to talk about flame there, uh, but also maybe the skills there as well, because um, everything that's going to improve our education is going to be interesting and and probably attract people to, uh, because everybody's curious, but there's still, um, uh, there's a lot of prejudice around it because people don't think you, you can practice skills in computer, which is wrong. <laughs> Uh, so uh, if if we could introduce some of uh, the techniques you're you're promoting there, it would be great. So we could follow up on that afterwards. So yeah, I, I'm very excited for Skillster, for example. Yeah. So uh, I'll send the contact details, and then um, uh, we'll of course try to also set up some research, but. Yeah, maybe for you, Julia, if it's an interesting topic <laughs> as a researcher, yeah. Yes, it definitely is. It's... Good. All right. Um, does anyone want to, to, to say something more or add something to the discussion? Just in a funny way, I would like to... Um talk directly to Andreas at uh, Skillster because uh, the 24th of November I was hit from the side by a fire truck in the city of Gävle who was on call out and I made all the police reported and, and so on and after an hour the driver of the fire truck called me up and he was uh, very sorry because uh, I was driving like an idiot he, he, he said. Yes, you really did. So I, said, I think you need to do some training. So I think you have a client there, Andreas. Yeah, sure. We will contact that uh, fire department in that, in that case. <laughs> <laughs> Great, good. Um, well done. I, I will hand it over to Martijn Boosman, who will do a closing note. Thank you, uh, Roy, and thank you, everyone. Um, I think we can continue talking uh, for a long period of time, but which is one of the objectives of the uh, foundation. Uh, but allow me to, to finish it off and make sure that everybody has contact information. I'd like to thank you for your participation on behalf of the, of the board. Uh, Vitor, you've already met. Okay. Ilona Heldal, Professor Heldal, unfortunately excuses herself. She cannot be present in this meeting. And myself as industry representative on the board. And I'm really happy to see what Cecilia and Roy have put together uh, in this second symposium. Uh, because it really fits the mission of uh, XR Effect, which is to bring together academia and end users and industry in a non-threatening, balancing way to make sure that we move XR, the use of XR technology further. And basically all the presentations and discussions show that we, I think, are achieving that objective. Uh, there is a open discussion about the complexities of introducing XR. Omar, thank you for being so honest about saying we wouldn't even have started with VR if we hadn't had the opportunity to try it. Uh, but also mention that it wasn't only about trying, but it was also very important that it was a research outcome, which then Cecilia, uh, you mentioned by bringing it together, all the data allows uh, researchers to come up to centralized conclusions. <laughs> 
Catherine, we've known each other for many years. Thank you very much for joining the XR Effect mm -hmm. team. Again, you are a showcase of what we try to achieve, academic background, but an end user, and now a, an industry uh, a representative. Um, you, you reflect the balance we're looking for, and I really appreciate you uh, on the team. Uh, Julia, uh, I've had the opportunity to follow your research a bit. Uh, great to see that you, as a, as a student, are able to set up a research which uh, is based around uh, academic protocols, which are set, for example, by Cecilia and the team, but also really allow further research. And I'm sure that there are researchers out there that wish to pick up where you left off. And as you know, we hope that you might be one of those researchers, maybe. <clears throat> um, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for the input. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to name everyone, but Justina, thank you for joining. And I really hope that there are activities that you can maybe present next time. Um, Suna, one of the godfathers of the whole idea of introducing and using VR. Um, Last but not least, all the industry supporters, thank you for, of course, supporting the, uh, the fact that the XRFX Foundation can live, but also for being patient and being acceptant of the fact that this is not a marketing and PR opportunity. This is a research opportunity, and our objective is to support researchers and end users to figure it out. Uh, is our technology something that they can use or are we just chasing ghosts? I think that's uh, that's what our industry objective is. Um, thank you, everyone. Roy, Cecilia, I trust that you're going to ensure that everybody has everyone's contact information. And the last thing I'd like to ask everyone is please share, share the word. I shout it around social media because it's great to have 13, 14 participants. It's better if we have 50 participants next uh, seminar. Cecilia, can I hand back to you? Because then it has a nice round, Roy, me, <laughs> then you, and then Roy can end it. Oh, I, I didn't seem to be able to unmute. Thank you. Yes, that's great that you said so. Our goal is to grow. The, this um, this um, forum is it's needed. We need it to to ex to exchange uh, um, experiences. I attend a lot of uh, research uh, conferences, and I'm kind of an outsider there because I'm talking about the real training in the real user organizations, uh, and th this is really a forum that I. I need to to learn more about what's going on and what's the needs and what's what's on the market. But I will uh, quickly hand over to you, Roy, because we missed someone who didn't get to present himself. Yes, um, there's some technical problem for me going on. Um, so I don't see him, but I get the message that he is here. Uh, Runar. Runar. Um, oh, who are you? Sorry, Ted, I didn't. <laughs> Gave you the opportunity to introduce yourself. Um, maybe if oh yeah okay now you're coming up good. Yeah, I I, run, I, I was uh, my plan was just to sit here and listen to you because uh, as Omar told you, uh, I'm going to retirement. This actually is my last work for the fire department because uh, this is my last day. I've been in, in the service for thirty five years. And they've uh, been uh, taking part, a uh, uh, big part in the in training and, and both in, in the ambulance service and, and the fire department, the fire service. So it's a, a, a privilege to to hand this uh, over to to the future uh, because I, I had a great time with the flame system and and I think that uh, uh, the VR or XR system is uh, uh, becoming a, a, a more and more part of, of, of training. I'm, I'm, I'm sure for that. So, uh, yeah, 
That's okay, Martha. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so thank you, everyone. It's been a, been a big pleasure to, to sit here and listen to, to you all. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for introducing yourself. Uh, again, sorry that I couldn't see you uh, and that I didn't give you the opportunity to introduce yourself earlier. Um, all right, yeah, then that was it for the second symposium of the XR Effect Foundation. Um, the, the date for the third symposium will be sent to you through email. Um, the presentations uh, of the, um, the speakers today will be sent to you, uh, so you can look it back. Um, uh, and of course, the, the uh, recording will also be posted on our social media. Um, so if you want to look back at a presentation, then uh, you have the opportunity to do so. Um, again, thank you all for coming and for making this possible. Uh, I really enjoyed it uh, personally, uh, all the presentations. It gave a good perspective on all the different uh, types of sectors that we work with, the industry, um, uh, academia, and the end users. Um, and I hope to see you all uh, next time again. So have a good weekend, everybody. And uh, yeah, we'll you meet too. again. <laughs> Thanks. Thank, thanks all. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Stay healthy. <laughs>